and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I'm your host, Nick Barksdale, but today we are joined by a very special guest, and that is none other than Dr. Jacob Lackner. Dr. Lackner, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thank you for inviting me again. To my subscribers who may not know this, Dr. Lackner officially has his own history YouTube channel. And for those who may not be familiar with it yet, or they are just now discovering it, would you mind telling us a little bit about your YouTube channel? Yeah, so uh, I just started it earlier this year uh, in January. It's called Nitsahone History and put out a video every Thursday dealing something with history. Uh, so far, most videos are, you know, given my area of expertise, most videos are about the Middle Ages or religious history. Uh, the video that came out today when we're recording this is about why Jews in the first century CE didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, sort of delving into uh, talking about what the idea, what the definition of Messiah was for Jews at the time and why Jesus didn't uh, fit it for them. So that's the kind of thing uh, I'm doing over there. And before we get started to my subscribers, check out the links in the video description below. It's going to take you to his YouTube channel. Subscribe, follow his work. I honestly can't recommend his channel enough. It covers a variety of complex issues. That is really one of the things I love most about history is the fact that it is so complex. And so ladies and gentlemen, speaking of complexity, we are bringing you a very interesting subject. And that is why did the crusades actually happen based on your research, based on your expertise and even your imagination when you hear or read the term crusades, what comes to your mind? Well, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things that come to mind. You know, um, I've taught courses on the Crusades. My research overlaps with the Crusades some too, uh, as well. And one of the things that really pops into my mind when I think about it is just the the things that I hear the general public say or think about the Crusades that I think are often sort of missing missing the point or too extreme on one side or the other because you sort of have one group of people who seem to think that the Crusades were entirely defensive. Uh, and then you have other people who think that the Crusades were uh, unchecked, even genocidal aggression from the perspectives of some. And these are all things I've had people say to me and want to talk to me about, like, you know, whenever, you know, people find out I'm a historian of the Middle Ages. The Crusades are something people feel like they know something about because they hear about it a lot. And most people do know the, ba the very basics, but it's hard for me not to think about the kind of narratives that I hear and how sort of messed up they are. And I guess that's sort of uh, what we're going to talk about today, that it's all more complicated uh, than all of that. One of the things for me, you know, I'm not a military historian for the most part. I can teach and talk about military history. I'm a religious and cultural historian. And for me, when I think about the Crusades, uh, the thing that really pops into my head is the really unique culture that developed in the Crusader states, the sort of syncretic culture uh, you have among people who lived there. You know, people often forget that there were Christians of, of European descent, Western Christians in the Levant uh, for about 200 years, people growing up there for generations who had very different culture uh, cultures than their uh, counterparts back in Europe. They, you know, spoke, many of them spoke Arabic. They began dressing like people from, from around there. They often were very happy to be at peace with their Muslim neighbors. And these are all like, you know, these cultural things that people don't normally think of when they think of the Crusades. That's kind of, to me, what's the most interesting. Even the kind of art and architecture produced by the Crusaders indicates uh, being influenced by Byzantine, Islamic, uh, Armenian, you know, all the different various cultures in the region. So, for me, the you know culture is really what comes to my mind the most, as well as I guess sort of thinking about these narratives uh, that people often have, these viewpoints they have about the Crusades when they sort of uh, come to the topic. And speaking of narratives, when it comes to historiography, what are a few of the different outlooks as to the origins of the Crusades and why they happened? Well, uh, you know they're. There, for the most part, people, historians are very nuanced uh, in their discussions um, of the Crusades. And you can't really say one thing caused the Crusades, like full stop. You can't really simplify it to that degree. Um, you know, one of the 
there are a lot of different factors that led to them. You know, among them are the ones for me, the ones that I think of first are sort of the concrete, obvious ones that we can find easily in historical, uh, you know, uh, documents and and so forth. And that is the rise of the Seljuk Turks um, who converted to Islam around 1000 uh, and immediately sort of turned into this juggernaut conquering, basically conquering the Abbasid Caliphate and uh, gaining control of it not long after that. And then also conquering territory from the Fatimid Caliphate, including Jerusalem. Uh, and then also winning several battles uh, against the Byzantines to the point where they were really deep into Asia Minor. So they captured Jerusalem from the Fatimids. Uh, an important thing to remember is Jerusalem is under the control of Muslims and has been for hundreds of years at this point, since the late 7th century. Oftentimes you'll hear some people think the, the cause of the crusade is that Muslims conquered it, and it's more complicated than that. One of the factors is that this specific group conquered it from the Fatimid Caliphate right around this time. And so in general, the Seljuks were a little less amenable and tolerant than their predecessors had been. And so pilgrimage to Jerusalem came into jeopardy uh, for uh, a lot of European Christians. And this really mattered to the nobility, the only people who could travel there. But it was a, a religious obligation that people really valued. Uh, so pilgrimage was sort of in trouble. That's one big factor. Um, another factor is that the Byzantine Empire need, wanted help. Um, the emperor at the time, Alexius II, um, after losing, you know, his predecessors and him had lost something, 10 battles or something to the Seljuks and were doing nothing to stop them. Uh, he sort of swallows his pride and sends a uh, group to the Council of Piacenza, a Western church council. And the reason I say swallows his pride is because the two churches had gotten very angry at each other in 1054, not that long before this, you know, a generation before, and had the heads of the church in the East and the West excommunicated each other. You know, it's called the Great Schism. And so the emperor now realizes he needs the help from the Pope uh, and people. And so he sends people to ask the Pope for help. And so when Urban II is delivering uh, his famous speech at Claremont, for him, you know, if you just, you know, we do have lots of versions of his speech. We don't know 100% exactly what he said, as is often the case. But if you sort of make a composite of everything he says, something that's consistent is he plays up the importance of pilgrimage being in jeopardy uh, and the fact that Christians in the East have asked for help, you know, and so those are really the concrete uh, causes, the, the impetus for the beginning of this crusade. Um, you do have some historians argue, too, that there's an element of uh, an attempt to control the violence uh, in Western Europe, you know, sort of the Frankish culture of violence uh, that was very common, lots of feuds and fighting amongst each other. And the church had been trying for a long time to fix this problem. Uh, two of the big ideas that come up, one in the late 10th century is called the peace of God, which comes up in 989. Uh, and it's when the church first attempts to outright try to control the violence of people. Uh, this, you know, true peace of God basically just says, you know, leave the church alone when you're killing each other, more or less. Uh, but then um, a few decades later, the truce of God is a little more um, uh, places a lot more limitations on violence. Uh, and it says, basically, you can't fight on a holiday, on a feast day. And if you like open up a Catholic calendar, you'll see, I mean, there, there weren't quite as many then, of course, but there were a lot. There were lots of days where you just couldn't fight. And all of this was trying to control this violence and promote peace. And some uh, historians uh, have argued that there is a the Crusades are sort of an extension of the same movement. Um, and, you know, that's probably a factor somewhat, but uh, we don't actually have a historical document outright telling us that that's the fact. The way we do with Urban saying pilgrimage is in danger, going to Jerusalem is in danger, uh, and the Byzantines need our help. So, you know, those are, those are the main sort of uh, factors that lead initially, at least, to the Crusade. And so, Dr. Lackner, as we approach the Crusades, we went through misconceptions, we went through historical viewpoints on this subject, and now I'd like to ask you, 
why do you think the Crusades happened? Well, you know, it's, yeah, if we're talking about the first crusade and why it starts in the first place, I think mostly, like I said, it's uh, the Seljuk Turks, you know, the Byzantines are worried about losing territory uh, and the Western Christians are worried about pilgrimage being in jeopardy. However, you know, once the Crusades themselves, once really get underway, um, you then have all of these other factors that emerge. Um, You know, one of the common misconceptions you'll see one way or the other uh, that, you know, because people, you know, there's not really a lot of nuance when people talk about this. And you'll hear people say, you know, either the Crusaders, none of them actually cared about religion, or you'll hear the other side. All they cared about is religion. Really, you know, all of these guys, if you look at the leaders of the First Crusade, for example, you can kind of like uh, create a spectrum. You can create a spectrum and for all of them, religion is a considerably important factor. It may not be the most important factor. Uh, and for some of them, it's probably the third or fourth most important factor. But the point is, almost everyone who goes on a crusade, especially the first crusade, does so partly out of religious obligation. But, uh, you know, it is true that some of the people who went on the first crusade, uh, including the one who would sort of break off from the main army and create the first crusader state, Baldwin of Bologna, you know, he's pretty far down on the totem pole in his family. He's not really going to inherit a whole lot. And, um, you know, for him, uh, he saw an opportunity while he was on this crusade and religious obligation was part of that. But he saw an opportunity to carve out his own territory. uh, And he did, you know, he went and very easily actually uh, takes the crusader state of Edessa because it's mostly where Armenian Christians live. And they don't like the Seljuks either. So it's very easy for him to sort of walk in and, and um, become the ruler. You know, there is potentially an assassination that happens and things. But the point is that he becomes the ruler. And then you have, you know, most famously on the First Crusade, probably Bohemund of Toronto uh, and his nephew or cousin. I don't remember which, but close relative, Tancred, who's much younger than him. Um, you know, the two of them. Uh, for them, religious obligation is part of it, but it's far down on, on what they're doing. And so you, the Crusades and these Crusader states being created, um, a lot of that is the result of individuals uh, being interested in carving out territory for themselves in a more, at least somewhat selfish way, um, apart from their religious obligations. Um, and that's those crusader states being created is really what causes the rest of the crusades. You know, uh, you have this Christian, Western Christian presence there because all these guys decided, you know, they're going to hold on to this territory. I mean, I, I didn't say it, but they're supposed to all give it back to the Byzantine emperor. Remember, he asked for their help. That's the plan. That's the agreement they made. Nobody does it. So uh, there are various reasons for that. Um, during the first crusade, their relationship becomes increasingly strained. I don't want to go too deep on it, but, um, you know, they they decide instead of giving land back that they conquer to the Byzantines, they just keep it themselves and create these unique, uh, you know, uh, somewhat strange, especially to outsiders, crusader states. And there'll be some presence there for almost, you know, between about uh, 1097 when the first crusader state is formed and 1291 when the, the last of the kingdom of Jerusalem, the city of Acre, falls there are Christians there. And as there are battles between these crusader states and neighbors, that's what causes the rest of these crusades, the changing of hands of other territories. So initially, uh, you know, to sum up, I'd say initially the main factors are the pilgrimage is in trouble and Western Christians legitimately want to go and help uh, their, their, you know, Eastern Christian uh, compatriots. They have a strained relationship from the beginning, but they do, want to help them. They like them more than these Seljuk Turks who are conquering territory from them. Um, But, you know, as the situation is actually playing out, as there's people's, you know, boots on the ground in Asia Minor and in the Levant, uh, they all start to, you know, have their own individual machinations that ultimately result in the creation of crusader states. So, you know, uh, wanting to conquer territory and hold on to it becomes a factor uh, in the long run, too, uh, in terms of the Crusader states. Uh, And that's what causes, largely anyway, the remaining Crusades. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today at the Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. Dr. Lackner 
has phenomenally and quickly guided us through a fascinating topic covering a variety of subjects to help people like me and you better understand the subjects that we all love. Go to his YouTube channel, subscribe, support all of the awesome work he is doing because people like him go out of their way to make history matter by bringing us a higher understanding of the subjects that we all love. Dr. Lackner, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Oh.